everybody to find a seat. Ask the sisters to cover your heads. Brothers, uncover your heads. We're going to stand and face Jerusalem. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth. Thy will be done in earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, For thine is the kingdom and, the power, and the power, and the glory, and the glory forever. forever. Praise the Lord, Praise the Lord. For, he is good. for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Praise the Lord God of Israel, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. In Jesus' name we pray, In Jesus name we pray. amen. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, now we're going to have a selection from the, the kids choir and the adult choir.
Happy Sabbath. Come on, y'all. Let's lift it up. Come on. Okay, get a quiet another hand. Both quiet, please. <laughs> Praise to the Most High God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Peace to everyone that's here today in the name of Jesus. Peace to everyone that's watching us live on the internet and listening on the phone line. And it's always good to stand before you on the Lord's Sabbath day. Where's my lesson? It's always good to stand before you on the Lord's Sabbath, and um, 
like always, get some understanding from his word. And the title is appropriate for the times of, that we're living in. And it's titled Sound Doctrine, which is the word of God, because anything other than that is unsound. Changed, into, changed to a lie. And as we go through this lesson, we're going to read some plain scripture that refutes all falsehood. And it's in the Bible that people take to them to church on Sunday. Okay? And we're going to do a little references as well to let you know that the people who gave you the deception know exactly what they did. So let's get right into the lesson. Sound doctrine. The word of God changed to a lie. It seems like, you know, nowadays, if you want to follow the Bible, you are crazy. And that's just insane to follow the word of God and people think something wrong with you. Okay, 1 Timothy. Chapter 6. We're going to start in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Pick it up at verse 3. Go ahead. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Now we're dealing with sound doctrine here, the doctrine of according to Jesus Christ. It's the same thing Paul taught. He taught the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Go ahead. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doubting, but doting about questions and strifes of words whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and, dis, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. So the person that teaches against the doctrine of Jesus, Jesus Christ, he is proud. In other words, he don't know. He's an empty wagon. Doting about questions and strifes of words whereof cometh envy, strife, readings, evil. From such a person, get away from them. Because they're going to take you to the lake of fire right along with them. Skip down to verse 12 and read it. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called. And has professed a good profession before many witnesses. So we got to fight the good fight of faith. I believe we have to fight for what we believe in. And that's a shame. The whole world should be accepting of this sound doctrine. But they don't want to hear it. Keep reading. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable unto the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you're supposed to keep the commandments 100% till the Lord comes back or till you die, whatever comes first. But you have to do die righteously. You have to die with white garments. Keep your garments white at all times. Go ahead. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate the king of kings and lord of lords. So when the time comes, he's going to show the world who's actually running this thing. Who's the king of kings, the lord of lords, what else? Who only hath immortality. And he's the only one that's immortal. He's the only one that has immortality. Go ahead. Dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man has seen nor can see. To whom be honor and power everlasting. So he's dwelling in light with no man can approach. No man has seen this. And no one can go exactly where Jesus. That's that third heaven that people say you go to when you die. Nobody's going there. Sound doctrine says the kingdom is coming down here. But that's not in the lesson. Otherwise, we'd have a hundred scriptures. I couldn't cover everything. But let's go to... um. Second Timothy, I mean, 17, read that. Amen. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. I didn't want that. That was a typo, but it was good anyway. 
2 Timothy 1. Flip back to, flip over to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and start at verse 1. Go ahead. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, Paul is writing a letter to Timothy here. He's, you know, he's really ecstatic about Timothy because he brought Timothy under the wing and, and um, taught him about Jesus, even though he had a solid foundation because he was the book that he was taught the scriptures from a child. But once he came up under Paul's wings, Paul honed him and refined him and left him in charge in his absence. Go ahead. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears that I might be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. So now we see, he says he remembers the unfeigned faith that started where? In his grandmama, Lois. And then in his mama, Eunice. These was Israelite women because we know Eunice married a Greek man. So who was teaching Timothy about the God of Israel? His mama and his grandmama. Mama them, right. <laughs> Go ahead. Wherefore I put in thee remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a sound mind. And what gives you a sound mind? Sound doctrine. Go ahead. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me in his prisoner. Be, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So don't be ashamed of this testimony. This is where you stand wholeheartedly in the faith. Don't be scared to say nothing to nobody, especially if they're talking crazy about the God of Israel. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's your mama. She say something crazy, she disrespecting the God that you serve, deal with it. Out of respect, of course. Within reason. You know what we're talking about. That's what sound mind comes in. You know how to deal with your parents and still respect them at the same time. Go ahead. Who has saved us and called us with an holy calling? Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. So who appointed Paul? Jesus. Did he, Jesus teach him anything different than what? Well, we can read that why are people attributing Paul's doctrine to the different doctrine of Christ? They go to Paul's writings to tell you, to tell you what? You don't have to keep the Sabbath. You don't have to keep the feast days. Paul never said none of that. Keep reading. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I, whom, for I, know whom I have believed. And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have, which have, which I have committed unto him against that day. So Paul is saying, telling him, look, even though I suffer the things for the gospel's sake, I know who I believe, and I'm persuaded to keep that which I have committed unto him against this day. Against the, I know what we're doing is right because we can read it. So I don't care what people say. Skip down to 17 and read it. I mean, I'm typoing all over the place. Keep reading. <laughs> Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. So hold fast to what? Sound words, which is none other than sound doctrine, which gives you a sound mind. Keep reading. That good thing which was committed unto thee, Keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phagilius and Hermonides. Okay, that's good on that. Maybe I needed to stop at 13. 
I don't know where 12 to 17 came. That's a definite typo. 1 through 13 was good. Now let's go to 2 John. I don't know what happened right there. Maybe I was up too early. 2 John. So sound words, sound mind, sound doctrine. Second John chapter one. But this sound doctrine they've changed into a lie. And they try to use the Bible to do it too. That's ooh we. I'm scared for you. Scared. You playing with fire. And what happens when you play with fire? You get burned. Second John one, pick it up at verse five, read it. And now I beseech thee, lady. Not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. That we love one another, and the Bible tells you real love is keeping the law. Go ahead. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that, as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. So whoever commits sin and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God in him. You mean Jesus had a doctrine? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Keep reading. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. So if anybody come to you bringing anything contrary to the doctrine, don't invite him in. But let's look at the doctrine of Christ. Let's see where he got it from. Go to John 7. So Jesus had a doctrine. And it wasn't Christmas and Easter. Let's see Jesus' doctrine and where he got his doctrine from. John 7, and pick it up at verse 14. Okay, read. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. So now Jesus, he's at the feast. So whoever, wherever his doctrine came from, they told him to keep the feast. Go ahead. And the Jews marveled, saying... How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but it's his that sent me. So Jesus told him, look, my doctrine is not mine. It's the doctrine of him that sent me. And who sent Jesus? The Father. People need to think about that. Go ahead. If any man will do his will, he shall know other doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. So if any man would do his will, which is the will of the Father, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So all you can do, all you can do, put them to the test to let them know, check them out, see if they're coming from God. The book say, try the spirits, try them. Their doctrine will let you know exactly where they're coming from. If they tell you you don't have to keep Sabbath day, they're coming from Satan. If they tell you you don't have to keep the feast days, all that was nailed to the cross, it's coming from Satan. That's not the doctrine of the Father or the Son. We finished that. Yes. Go to John 12. Flip over to John 12. And pick it up at verse 23. So we're dealing with sound doctrine right now. The doctrine of the Father and the Son. Because they don't want accord. 12 and 23, read it. And Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. 
He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life, life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause I am coming to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. So now Jesus is saying, look, he that loveth his life shall lose it. And if you hate your life, if you hate his life in this world, and shall keep it in this wait a minute. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. So you have to deny yourself in this world because this world is wicked. And it's easy, easy to fall back into that wickedness. So you have to constantly bring your body into subjection. So you can get the reward of eternal life because I hate my life in this. I hate it. Hate, 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 hate. Go ahead. But now my soul is troubled. What shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. But for this cause came I into this hour right here. Go ahead, 28. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So when he said, Father, glorify thy name, all of a sudden the voice came from heaven. And the, the voice said, I have both glorified it and I'm going to glorify it again. Go ahead. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? So the people answered and said, look, we've heard out of the law that Christ abided forever. And where did they hear that? They heard it in Isaiah. They heard it in Daniel. It's all over Psalm about Christ abiding forever. So these people was reading. They knew something. But they didn't understand that Jesus was that individual. Because they said, look, we heard out of the law that Christ abided forever. How says the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? 35, read it. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed, and did hide himself from, from them. So he told them, look, walk in the light while you got it, speaking of himself. Listen to what I'm telling you. Because I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be gone. And then it's darkness going to come up on the world. And we got it. Darkness is here. Because there's very few people that's walking in the light right now. Very few of us. Skip down to verse um, 44 and read it. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. So Jesus said, look, if you believe on me, you believe it on the Father. You believe it on him that sent me. We need to hammer that home. They think Jesus came with a different doctrine. No, he did not. His doctrine is the same as the father. The father told him what to say. Go ahead. He that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The, world, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So Jesus said, look, if you reject me and you don't receive my words, these same words that you reject are going to judge you in the last day. Because the Bible says the books were open. And everybody was judged out of those books. Everybody. Everything's being recorded what you do. Everything's being recorded what you say. You do not want to be in that great white throne of judgment because it's a dice roll for you. And that's up to the Lord whether he have mercy on you. But if them books, if your righteousness don't outweigh your unrighteousness, you go into the lake of fire. 
But you got to keep the sound doctrine. Don't get caught up in that lie because deception is out there. People are deceiving people in the name of Jesus. And the only reason they're being deceived is because they don't read. Nobody reads the book. Everybody looking up here. Instead of down there reading. Where were you at? 49. Read it. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whosoever, whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Powerful statement made by Jesus. The Father told him what to say. That's why I tell these people, you know, you only got to keep nine commandments. Where did you hear that from? Where did you read that at? Who told you that? And I'm supposed to listen to you. There's ten rules out there, but I'm only supposed to keep nine of them. Because you told me to, right? Please. I'm going to read the book. John 5. Flip back to John 5. One verse, 39. Read it. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So Jesus told the people, search the scriptures. From Genesis to Malachi, everything talks about Jesus. Everything. But if you don't search the scriptures, you won't know. You won't get this sound doctrine. You will believe a lie in the name of Jesus. Like he was born on December 25th, right? That's what they tell you. That's a lie. And they try to use the Bible, sound doctrine, to support it. So they take sound doctrine, change it into a lie, spoon feed it to you, because that's what they do to babies. They spoon feed them, right? Because babies don't know. And because you don't read, you don't know either. So in other words, you believe a lie in the name of Jesus. Let's go to Ephesians 4. That's why we read here. Anybody here that's been here for a good six months, you can take down a preacher that has a doctorate in theology. You can take them down. How? Read a few scriptures to him out of his Bible that's worth about a million dollars with the calf skin and Sheepskin, whatever it's made of, if he lets you touch it. But Ephesians 4, 1 verse, verse 14, read it. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. So look, therefore we henceforth, because we had a knowledge, we cannot be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You like a leaf in the wind. You want to go here. The worst thing is, is when Israel find out they're Israel. And they start Googling and searching. And you see all these people know they're Israel too. They got a doctrine. They got a doctrine. They got a doctrine. They got a doctrine. And the ones, the Israelites that deal with Jesus, you got to watch them too. Because they talk crazy. But you know the ones because the Lord will put you in the right path. He will put you on the right path and you will find out who's who when it comes to Israelite teaching. You'll find out. Because as long as you steadfast in what's coming out of this book, you deal with the name of Jesus, the mother Hebrews will come to you. They're going to come to try to shake you up because you're dealing with a name. And that's just the start of it. Everywhere in the dark, the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. 2 Timothy 4. Second Timothy 4. And then we're going to find out where all this unsound doctrine came from. And who gave it to you? Because they don't hold nothing back. They tell you. But they betting on you not reading. 
And they got a billion people out there that don't read, so they rolling with it. And the worst thing you can do is get caught up in something and you don't know nothing about it. Second Timothy 4 and verse 3, read it. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. So the time will come when don't nobody want to hear sound doctrine. This right now, this is that time. Nobody wants to hear sound doctrine. They want a teacher that's going to scratch their ear. Tell them a lie. Go ahead. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. And what's the truth? Sound doctrine. They're going to turn away their ear from the truth. And what? And shall be turned unto fables. And turned unto fables. They want to hear a lie. That's what people want. They want to be lied to. Because this sounds good. It's too hard to do sound doctrine. Too many restrictions on that. Let's go to Daniel 7 and show you where this, who's a perpetuator other than Satan himself. But Satan got to work through individuals to get his mission accomplished. Just like God works through people to get his mission, Satan is out there too. Daniel 7. We're going to pick it up at verse 7. That's too small for me to read. Daniel 7 and, and verse 7. And we're just going to deal with this fourth piece because this chapter alone is a lesson within itself. But I'm just going here for to show you where all this stuff came from. And who brought it to fruition? Seven and seven, read it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. Now the, it other three, the other three beasts, the one was a lion with eagle's wings, then you had a bear, then you had a leopard. But it was nothing to describe this beast other than dreadful and terrible. Nothing in the Lord's creation could Daniel describe this beast as being. Other than dreadful and terrible, it had iron teeth, it break into pieces, stamped the residue, and it was different from all the other beasts, and it had ten horns. Verse 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. So amongst them ten horns, a little horn came up, and he took down the other three. Three of the ten horns, he took them down. And he had eyes like a man, he had a mouth speaking great things. His speech was captivating to people. Every time he spoke, people would listen. Everywhere he went, crowds would gather. Because he was coming to say something. And whatever he said, you better take heed to it and listen. Because if you don't, he's going to get you. Speaking great things. Look at him when he go, don't they? Whenever he show up, man, he could, if they had two football stadiums, he'd pack them. Because everybody wanted to hear what this cat got to say. Even though he's lying out his teeth, they still fill them stadiums up just to hear it. Skip down to verse 15 and read it. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by me and asked, asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. So now he wanted to know about this fourth beast. What's the truth about this guy? Tell me, who is this guy? Go ahead. 
and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them. So whoever this little horn is, he going to make war with the saints. The saints are the one that's keeping the sound doctrine. He's going to make war with them, and he's going to beat them. People that's keeping the word of God are going to get beat down by this little horn and his army. Skip down to verse 23 and read it. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And it's going to devour the whole earth, this fourth kingdom. The system and the thinking is everywhere all over the world. Everywhere. Everywhere you go, you have some residue of the mama and her daughters too. If the mama's not there, I guarantee you the daughter's there. The whole earth, the book says, is going to devour. Go ahead. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. And another shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first. And he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. So this little horn is going to speak great words against the Most High. What else? And shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And he's going to beat the saints down. Go ahead. And think to change times and laws. Change times and laws of who? Not man. Times and laws of God. He's going to think to change times and laws. Go ahead. And they shall be given into his hand until a time in times and in the dividing of times. So the Bible says he's going to wear out the saints, speak great words against the Most High. He ain't speaking for God. He's speaking against God. And he's going to change some of God's times and some of his laws too. Let's go look at one of them. Go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2. Let's see what the Lord set up in the beginning before this little horn even came on the scene. But he took it upon himself to say, okay, God did not know what he was talking about when he gave us the Sabbath day. We need something new. Genesis 2. And pick it up at verse 1. So we're going to take, we're going to bring the Sabbath day from the beginning where it was instituted and see if anything changed in the New Testament. And if we can't find a change, and somebody made a change somewhere. Because it's not in the Bible. Two and one, read it. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he has made. So when did God rest? The seventh day. Seventh day, right? And what else did he do? Go ahead. And God blessed the seventh day. And sanctified it. So he blessed the what day? Seventh day. And sanctified it too, right? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So God did this all on his own. He didn't need no help from any man. Go ahead. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Verse 5, read that, I'm sorry. And every plant on the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. So where was man when the Sabbath was instituted? Hadn't even been created yet. He was still dirt in the ground. The Lord did this all on his own. So where does man's gall come in to say, God, you didn't know what you was talking about? This man is crazy. Go to Exodus 20. And we know this is Sabbath. This Sabbath is for all mankind because it was people, other than civilizations, keeping a seventh day rest before it was instituted to Israel. We got a lesson to show you that. Exodus 20, verse 8, read it. Remember the Sabbath day. To keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day. The commandment that starts with remember everybody has forgotten. 
until you bring it to them. Like, yeah, that's, that is, yeah, the seven days is the seven. But, I always remember that but. We keep Sunday. You didn't read it in plain English. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But no, we don't want to keep that day holy. We want to keep Sunday holy. Keep reading. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now this is in the Ten Commandments now. This is in the Ten, the same Ten Commandments the Lord had written twice, because Moses broke the first set. So he said, told Moses, get you two more tables, and I'm going to rack this stuff again. And then something that is etched in stone, that means it's forever. But people want to belittle this stuff to tell you don't have to keep the Sabbath day. Just keep nine of the commandments. Don't worry about the Sabbath. That's for somebody else. I can't read that. Sound doctrine don't tell me that. But just in case you think it changed in the New Testament, let's go look at Jesus who said, the doctrine's not mine. It's from the Father. Luke chapter 4. Let's see if it changed when Jesus came on the scene. But you know, they gonna, the whole world going to keep this Sabbath when Jesus comes back. You can read that in Isaiah 66. They're going to keep it. Just like man forced Sunday on you, Jesus got to force the Sabbath back on you. And there will be consequences this time for not keeping it. You won't get no rain on your crops. And that's just for starters. That's the last resort. I mean, that's the first resort. The last resort is just purging you out. Luke chapter 4 and um, 14, read it. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went a fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. So now Jesus went back into the power of the Spirit. He had some sound doctrine in him. And he went into the synagogues and he taught. Go ahead. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. So he went back home where he was brought up, Nazareth, where nothing good can come from, right? Go ahead. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on a Sabbath day and stood up for the read. Now this is Jesus. Went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up and read. Something strange nowadays. That's why they give you Sunday, so you don't have to read. You just buy a ticket, watch the show, and come back next Sunday. Let's go to Acts 17. So Jesus kept the Sabbath. Let's see about Paul. Remember, Paul got his doctrine from Jesus too. Let's see if Jesus told him, man, after I die, tell the people to keep Sunday now. Seventeen and one, read it. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where it was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them in three Sabbath days, reasons with them out of the scriptures. So Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them in three Sabbath, three weeks, three Sabbath days, reason with them, where? Out of the scriptures. Now there was no acts when this was going on. Acts was being written. So what scriptures was he reasoning with them out of? Genesis to Malachi. The same scriptures Jesus told you to search. You want to know about Jesus? Go to the Old Testament. But if they keep you out of it, they give you their version of Jesus. Blonde hair, blue eyes, love everybody, didn't get beat beyond recognition. 
rose on Easter Sunday, was born December 25th. That's the New Testament Jesus they give you because they keep you out the Old Testament. Keep reading. We finish that one. No, three and four. Three and four. Reading. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them that believe and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude and of the chief women, not a few. So some of them believe, but Paul was reasoning with them out of the scriptures, telling the people out the Old Testament that Christ must suffer and be risen from the dead out of the Old Testament. That's how we can preach Jesus. And we won't even have to go into the New Testament if you got some understanding. But if you don't read, you don't know nothing. Now let's look at this Sunday. It's in the handout. Some of y'all got it. I couldn't print it all up. So he was going to think, change times and laws. But we can't read it in the Bible where Sunday was the day of worship. Now it was transferred, changed, they, what they call it. They changed it. They changed it. They changed it. Who changed it? We about to find out right now. Sunday at the encyclopedia. Read what it says. From the Universal Standard Encyclopedia, Sunday, first day of the week, observed by Christians almost universally as a holy day of honor of the resurrection of Christ. Now where did they get that from? Go ahead. The hallowing of Sunday appears incontestably as a definite law of the church in the beginning of the 4th century. So the 4th century, 300 some years after Jesus. The hallowing of Sunday. But we can read in Genesis... That in the beginning of creation, the seventh day was hallowed and sanctified before man even came on the scene. But this Sunday worship was, sanct was, was hallowed and given a law around the 300s. Go ahead. Constantine confirmed the custom by a law of the state. Throughout the medieval period, um, the authority of the church was so universally recognized that secular leg legislation in this regard was almost unnecessary. The Catholic Church then required and still requires abstinence from servile work on that day and the assistance of at mass of all who are not lawfully hindered. So you better not work on the Catholic Church. Say you better not work on that day and you better come to church. For 20, 25 minutes, however long it is long as you show up, then you can do what you want to do. But what church are we talking about? The Catholic Church. That little horn, that eyes like a man and a mouth speaking great things. He's telling you that you don't have to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath with the sound doctrine that we can read. You can keep Sunday, which you can't read, which is a lie. Second page of the handout. Go ahead. What was the first Sunday law in history? Constantine's Sunday law of March 7, 321. On a venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and the people residing in the cities rest and let all workshops be closed. In the country, however, persons engaged in agriculture may freely and lawfully continue their pursuits because it often happens on another day that is not so suitable for grain sowing or for vine planting. Lest by neglecting the proper moment for such operations, the bounty of heaven should be lost. Given the seventh day of March, Crispus and Constantine being consuls, each of them for the second time. Codex of Justinius in the Library 3, um, Title 2-3, translated by Philip Schaeff, History of the Christian Church, Volume 3 of 1902, page 380. So this came out of a history book. They're telling you who gave you Sunday. But do people read? No. What else? What church council required Sunday observance and forbade Sabbath observance? The Council of Laodicea decreed that Christians should keep the Sunday and that if they persisted on resting on the Sabbath, they shall be shut out from Christ. So they're telling you, look, <laughs> y'all better keep Sunday. But if you continue to do this Sabbath, we ain't going to let you in the church. Yeah. What is that? That's not sound doctrine. Is yeah. that it? Yeah, that was um, from the history of the councils of the church, so volume the, two, the page Catholic 316. Church, this is in all their books. But do they people read it? Nope. And even if they did read it, they wouldn't believe it. Wouldn't believe it. 
What else? One more thing. The next two handouts. This is out the Catholic Mirror. This thing was written around the 1800s. That's some more references later on. But keep read that. We're going to hit and miss a little bit, but read it. Right, the Law of Men. The first Christian Sunday law states, let all judges and all city people and all tradesmen rest upon a venerable day of the sun. Sunday, that's why they call it Sunday. For the sun worshipers. Go ahead. But let those dwelling in the country freely and will and with full liberty attend to that culture of their fields. Since it frequently happens that no other day is so fit for the sowing of grain and the planting of vines. Hence the favorable time should not be allowed to pass. Let the provisions of heaven be lost. That's from the Edict of March 7, 321 A.D. from Corpus Juris Civilius in Library 3, Title 12, Lexan 3. So you these are laws, right? Don't they have one of them civil laws? They got article so-and-so, point, boom, 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 this and that. They got that from Rome. But go ahead. For several centuries, Christians observe Sunday simply as a day of worship without being able to give it the specific meaning of Sabbath rest. Only in the fourth century did the civil law of the Roman Empire recognize the weekly recurrence, determining that on the day of the sun, the judges, the people of the cities, and the various trade corporations would not work. That's from Pope John Paul II. Dies Domini, Dies Hominis. Yeah, yeah, yeah yada, uh, yada. But the Lord said rest on the seventh day, right? <laughs> this guy say the first day. He going to think to change times and laws. Go ahead. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate or change laws, and to dispense with all things, even the post precepts of Christ. Wait a minute now. The Pope? Has the power to what? Change law? Even what Christ written? That little horn. He's going to think to change times and laws. He's going to take sound doctrine and turn it into a lie. Go ahead. Said Decreto de Transatlantic Episcopale, I'm guessing. This, my friends, is blasphemy. The Pope believes that he can forever change the laws of the very creator without retribution. Notice this very similar wording in the book of Daniel. That's why he's going to throw him in a lake of fire as soon as you show up. Ain't no sense in him standing in judgment, dude. You're going straight to the lake. Go ahead. From the Holy Bible, the King James Version in Daniel chapter 7, verse 21. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And think to change times and laws. And that's what we read. So they're telling you who that's talking about. Go ahead. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and a dividing of times. The Pope has authority and has often exercised it to dispense with the command of Christ. That's from the decreto of the transatlantic Episcopal, whatever. And other scriptures will tell you where he got this authority from. Straight up from the dragon, Satan, the devil. Satan is totally opposite of God. So if he got somebody working in his stead, he going to make decrees that are what? Opposite of God. That's where his authority is coming from. Go ahead. This is very true as he did away with God's seventh day Sabbath and replaced it with his own first day, our Lord's day, the day of the sun God. Okay, that's good on that. Let me see something else. Yeah, read that too. From the top? From the top? No, the next one. Yeah, read that. Yeah, start at the top. In respecting religious liberty and the common good of all, Christians should seek recognition of Sundays and the church's holy days as legal holidays. Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1994, page 585. So they're telling you, look, keep Sunday and the church holy days, right? Yep. Christmas, Easter, and if you're a good Catholic, Feast of the Assumption. Uh, what else they got? You good Catholics out there? Y'all out there somewhere? Whole bunch of stuff. Every day is a feast day or something. Ash Wednesday, Lent. All that foolishness you can't read in the book. But go ahead. 
Therefore, also in the particular circumstances of our own time, Christians will naturally strive to ensure that civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. In any case, they are, they are obliged in conscience to arrange their Sunday rest in a way which allows them to take part in the Eucharist, refraining from work and activities which are incompatible with the sanctification of the Lord's day, with the characteristic joy and necessary rest for the spiritual body. For That's from 112, Pope John Paul, his thing. Right. The Code of Canon Law of 1917 for the first time gathered this tradition into a universal law. The present code reiterates this, saying that on Sundays and other holy days of obligation, the faith are bound to attend mass. This legislation has normally been understood and entailing a grave obligation. This is the teaching of the catechism of the Catholic Church. And it is easy to understand why we keep in mind how vital Sunday is for the Christian life. That was a quote from Dias Domini, Pope John Paul II in 1998. In this matter, my predecessor, Pope Leo XIII, in his encyclical Rerum Novarum, <laughs> spoke of Sunday rest as a worker's right which the state must guarantee. That's from Pope John Paul II. Okay, that's good. So this is a serious law. But they don't enforce it, not yet. But it's coming. And it's on the books, too. Let's get back to the book. So he didn't gave you the Sabbath day. Let's see what else he didn't gave you. Let's see who's the intercessor between God and man, according to the book. <laughs> Let's look at some sound doctrine. John 14. One verse, verse 6. Okay, read. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now this is out of Jesus' own mouth, which the Father told him to say. Keep that in mind. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come through the Father but by me. So you have to go through Jesus to get to the Father. According to what we read, there's no other way. Flip over to chapter 15 and start at verse 1. Read it. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, as it of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. So the books say what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So you have to abide in Jesus. That's where your strength comes from. Go ahead. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gathered them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So it's consequences of not abiding in Jesus. It's called fire. Go ahead. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. So how do you have the love of Jesus in your heart? That's what they call it. I got the love of Jesus right here. You keep the commandments, and you keep the love of Jesus right here. That's how you know you got the love of God in you. And it's going to show it. It's going to show. That's what the fruit is, your action. If you're thinking evil, you're going to act evil. If you got the love of Christ in you, you're going to keep the commandments and keep that sound doctrine. Flip over to John 6. Flip back to John 6. So according to what we read, the only way to the Father is 
through Jesus. Through Jesus. He is the only way. 6 and 32. Read it. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth light unto the, giveth life unto the world. So who is that bread of God? Jesus. Jesus is that bread that came down so you can eat it. And that bread is none other than his words that he got from the Father. We've got to keep reiterating that. Go ahead. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. So you have to go to Jesus to get that bread, right? Go to him. He's the way. Um, skip down to 44 and read. No man can come to me except the father which has sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. Now that's a powerful statement. Nobody can come to Jesus unless the Father draws you to him. And this ain't no presto change your sinner's prayer. I'm good to go. You have to be drawn to Jesus from the Father. That means the Father was working at all of us to bring us to this point to come to the true and living God, Jesus. Because Jesus and the Father on one accord. You can't come up in here doing Christmas. You can't come up in here doing Easter. You can't go back and forth. Well, I'm going to do Saturday with these cats. And then I'm going to go to Sunday church. We had a guy in here that tried to do that. He gone now. Gone. Keep reading. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that have heard and have learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man has seen the Father, save he which is of God, he has seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So who's the living bread? Jesus. But this guy claims he's a replacement of Jesus. Is he giving you some living bread? <laughs> His bread is moldy, foul smelling, and it's going to kill you. Go to... um. John 10. So Jesus is the true vine. He's the bread of life. He's the only way to the Father. John 10 and pick it up at verse 1. John 10 and verse 1. Read it. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. So this cat not coming through the door. He coming through the back door or the window. Go ahead. But he that entereth in by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. I ain't never seen a thief break in your house through the front door. Some do, but most of them, 90% of them go through the back or the window. But keep reading. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. And how come you don't follow no stranger? Because a stranger is coming with some bad doctrine. And the ones that understand sound doctrine, they can see a stranger coming a mile away just by what he say and how he act. That's why if you're solid in this word, can't nobody trip you up. 
The lost books can't even do it if you solid in this book right here. But you got to stay strong. Sound doctrine. Keep reading. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So Jesus is the door of the sheep. You got to come through Jesus. He's the only way. Go ahead. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling and is not a shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catches them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. So the hireling, is a, is a, he fleeth because he don't care about the sheep. It's like when you got to rent a car, right? <laughs> you don't care about that car, boy. You run over the tracks 50 miles an hour, hit curbs and everything. <laughs> Go ahead. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and I am known of mine as the father knoweth me. Even so, I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. OK, let's go to um, first Timothy. So Jesus is the good shepherd. He know his sheep. How do you know Jesus know his sheep? Because the father gave him to him. He know who playing and who ain't. He's a good shepherd. He's a true vine. He's the bread of life. He is the only way to the Father. So that makes him the what? The mediator. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Read it. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that they are in authority, that we, may be lead, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So he wanted this, like I say, this salvation is for everybody. The Bible says the Lord has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He wants the wicked to turn and start following righteousness so he can be saved. And the only way to do that is to come through Jesus. Who will have all men to be saved and come to what? The knowledge of the truth. Go ahead. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. That's none other than Jesus. So in order to get to the Father, you got to go through him. There are not many paths to God like some person famous would say there's only one path to the father and that's through Jesus but let's look at this let's go to Luke chapter 1 let's look at what Jesus mama said she knew something and this is you know we all know who Jesus mama is His name is Mary right that's her name Let's see what she said. Luke 1 and verse 46. Luke 1 and 46. Okay, read. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed for he that is mighty hath done me to me great things and holy is his name. So who is Mary giving reverence to now? Christ herself. Exactly. Keep reading. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. Now Mary is quoting scripture. In case y'all didn't know. Keep reading. He hath filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent empty away. He hath helped his servant Israel. In remembrance of his mercy. 
as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. So now Mary is what? She's saying, look, Abraham, <laughs> our fathers, and to his seed forever. Why is Mary saying this? If you've been given another Mary, you wouldn't even know this. The Mary you've been given is what? She looks blonde sometimes, right? They got a bunch of them out there. She's Mexican too, Guadalupe. Fatima, she's Italian too. Lourdes is what? Another Mexican, Spanish? I don't know. And don't forget the black Madonna too that's over there in Russia. Don't forget that one. So Mary comes in all colors. But let's look at this Mary though, the one that Papa going to give you. Let's go to the handout. Because they had to do something to feed you this Mary that they have today. Because you go down to Mexico, Mary is bigger than Jesus. You got this big old picture of Mary and a little bitty picture of Jesus. And people are on their knees worshiping Mary, saying all kind of rosaries and stuff like that. But somebody had to give it to you. And they had to take the sound doctrine in the book, change it into a lie so you can absorb it and do it. Because you can't have a billion people if they're not fooled. This is our pictorial history of the Italian people. Page 69. It's a history book. You can go on Amazon, eBay, whatever you want to get it. But they had to figure this out, how to get the people. Okay, read it. By adjusting the Bible to the intellectual and practical requirements of his time through free allegorical interpretation. So now this guy adjusted the Bible. How do you adjust the Bible? Go ahead. St. Gregory, in his writings, clarified the distinctive Catholic position, his belief in a Christianity dedicated to the care of the souls of the departed. Wait a minute now. His belief in Christianity is the care of the souls of the departed. What else? Praying to the Virgin and the saints as intermediaries between man and God. Wait a minute. We've been reading the whole time that Jesus is the mediator between man and God. But this guy, in his distinctive Catholic position, says, okay, you can pray to Mary and to the saints, which lots of Catholics do. They pray to the saints. They got a saint for everything. You, if you lose your keys, pray to this saint. You'll find them. Then they pray to Mary. You know, what is this rosary thing that they say all the time? And these rosary beads. Mary is dead. Keep reading peopling the afterlife with the hierarchical order of angels and demons appealed to Italians whose Roman forebearers had honored the souls of their ancestors, worshipped deities, and felt the fascination of Eastern mother goddess creeds. St. Gregory was repelled by Greco-Roman civilization and paradoxically did more than anyone else to facilitate the absorption of pagan residues into Italian Christianity. So before they caught up with this dude, the damage had already been done. Because Romans was already steeped in paganism anyway. So let's take the word of God and say, Mary, you know, virgin, mother of God, you know, she up in heaven too. You can pray to her. All these people that died, they was good people. Let's make them saints. Pray to them too. But the damage had already been done. We finished that. No. Through that process of absorption, any paganism hostile to Christianity remaining in Italian rural communities faded away. A Benedictine, Benedictine monk himself, St. Gregory, promoted the spread of monastic life, monastic life in Italy. He instigated missionary activities among the Lombards who had previously embraced Christianity as its Aryan interpretation and among the German invaders of Britain. That's good. So this dude adjusted the Bible through free allegorical interpretation. When the Bible says no prophet of the scripture of any private interpretation. But he's going to make his adjustments so people can roll along with this paganism. But that's good. Now, since we're on the subject of Mary, let's look at the next handout. Because they done made Mary a god. Good luck with this name right here.
Take your time. All right. Uh, Munifestissimus Deus. From Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. Munifestissimus Deus. Latin. The most bountiful God. So that's what that means. The most bountiful God. And it's all talking about Mary. She's a God now. And the teaching is this. She is sent. Well, we're going to read it. Go ahead. Is the name of an apostolic constitution written by Pope Pius the Twelfth? It defines ex cathedra, the dogma of the assumption of the blessed Virgin Mary. It was the first ex cathedra infallible statement since the official ruling on papal inf infallibility was made at the first Vatican Council in 1869-1870. In 1854, Pope Pius IX made an infallible statement with infallibius deus on the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary, which was a basis for this dogma. Now, the Immaculate Conception, people confuse that with talking about Jesus. That's got to do with Mary. The whole Immaculate Conception is concerned in Mary, not Jesus, according to Catholics. But those who don't understand Catholic doctrine think it's talking about Jesus. No, no, no. This is all about Mary. Go ahead. This decree, the decree was promulgated on November 1st of 1950. The historical background. Pope Pius XII's previous encyclical, De Parare Virginis Mariae. Okay. <laughs> Something Italian. Close enough. <laughs> on May 1st of 1946, to all Catholic bishops stated that for a long time past, numerous petitions have been received from cardinals, patriarchs, archbishops, bishops, priests, religious of both sexes, associations, universities, and innumerable private persons, all begging that the bodily assumption into heaven of the Blessed Virgin should be defined and proclaimed as a dogma of faith. So now they came up with this thing, Mary... Ascended up to heaven bodily, just like Jesus, right? So they were like, look, man, we got to make this a law. So they all came together, and, you know, Pope went right along with it because he operated not the powers of Satan. So they established this, that Mary ascended bodily into heaven, and they got a church built over there in Jerusalem, right on top of where they say she ascended up to heaven. And it's a Catholic church, too. But that's good on that. Read the next page. Read all that on next page. Some of it. This belief is the corporeal assumption of Mary is founded on the apocryphal treatise de Optu Saint Domine, bearing the name of Saint John, which belongs, however, to the fourth or fifth century. It is also found in the book De Transitu Virginis, falsely ascribed to Saint Milito of Sardis and is a spurious letter attributed to St. Denis the Areopagite. If we consult genuine writings in the East, it is mentioned in the sermons of St. Andrew of Crete, St. John Damascus, Damascene, St. Modestus of Jerusalem, and others. In the West, St. Gregory of Tours, the Gloria Mart, I guess Martyr I, mentions it first. The sermons of St. Jerome and St. Augustine for this feast, however, are spurious. St. John of Damascus, page 1, of 90, volume 1 of 96, thus formulates the tradition of the Church of Jerusalem. So now, they're quoting a lot of things where this was written from, but if you notice, they ain't quoting the Bible at all, because it's not in the Bible that Mary did all this. Sound doctrine would dispel all of that. That's why I got another, I didn't put it in this one, but they got another article that when they asked the Pope for some proof out the Bible, he couldn't, he couldn't give it to them because it ain't in the Bible. But what happened? People went for it. And they still doing to this day. Saying this hell made full of growl that keep reading. Skip down to that one right there. Today. Today. The belief in the corporeal assumption of Mary is universal in the East and in the West, according to Benedict the Fourteenth, the the Festus BVM something some yeah, type skip, of book. Skip down to the note. <laughs> the note: 
by promulgating the Bull Manifestissimus Deus, 1st of November 1950, Pope Pius XII declared infallibility that the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary was a dogma of the Catholic faith. Likewise, the Second Vatican Council taught in the dogmatic constitution Lumen Gentium, Gentium that the Immaculate Virgin perceived, preserved, free from all stain of original sin, was taken up body and soul into heavenly glory when her earthly life was over and exalted by the Lord as queen over all things. So now, what does the Bible say? Jesus said, no man has ascended to heaven. Sound doctrine to kill that. So now, according to Catholic doctrine, you got the Father, Jesus sitting at his right hand, and Mary sitting at the right hand of Jesus. So you got a king in heaven and a queen. Also, it all have sinned. And people are going for this. Let's get to the book again. We're going to start wrapping this up. Matthew 12. We just got out of this foolish thing that they call Easter. We ain't going to, that's a lesson within itself, but we're going to touch on a few things. Some sound doctrine that Jesus said. Matthew 12. 38. 12 and 38. Read it. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So that's the sign that Jesus told him, Look, I'm the Christ. I'm going to go back and read Jonah. Because you can't read Matthew because Matthew wasn't written. So he said, and he said, Search the scriptures, right? So he told him, look, read Jonah's. Jonah's in the bell, the whale's belly, three days and three nights. Well, I'm going to be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. That's the only sign I'm going to give you. Okay, three days and three nights. Let's go to Mark real quick. Let's go to Mark. Mark 8, one verse. Because three days and three nights, you know, a day is not really a day in the Bible according to people. They're giving you some doctrine that, well, if you were in there a part of the day, that's considered the whole day. But you can't read that in the book. The Bible says the evening and the morning are the first day. Mark 8 and 1 verse 31. Okay, read. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. Okay, so now Mark say after three days. After three days. So we're still dealing with three days, right? Go to Luke. Luke chapter 9. Because we got to establish this three-day period. Because there's some doctrine out there. It says Jesus wasn't in the grave three days and three nights. But sound doctrine is what we're reading. is letting us know three days, three nights. After three days, let's see what Luke say. Luke 9, verse 20. Go ahead. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, The Christ of God. And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. So Jesus even said again, once again, Luke, three days, evening in the morning, evening in the morning, evening in the morning, three days, three nights. He referred us to Jonah. Let's go read it just to make sure Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days and three nights. Jesus says, search the scriptures. We're going to search them. Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. Because the teaching out there, you know, we just came out of that paganism holiday that was just past. It's called Easter Sunday. Papa say he died Friday and rose Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning. 
But Jesus said three days, three nights. After three days, however you want to put it, three days and three nights is 72 hours. You can't get no way around it. But I guess when you get to the Bible, day don't really mean a day. And where they read that from, I don't know. But Jonah 1 and 17, read it. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So now Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, just like Jesus said he was going to be dead. Now, you, like I said, you book a three-day, three-night cruise, you expect to get three days and three nights. <laughs> you don't expect to leave out on Friday night and come back Sunday morning. You're going to want your money back. But where do we get the three days and three nights from? The Bible. But let's look at this. This is from the Associated Press. This is this last Pope, Pope Benedict. He was looking at the Shroud of Turin. He said, it's authentic because, you know, the Pope can't be wrong in nothing according to them. But he said, this Shroud is authentic. It was the actual burial cloth of Jesus. But let's see what else he said. Read that. Pope Benedict says shroud to turn authentic burial rope of Jesus. And if it, and it doesn't matter what science says about its authenticity, the AP story went on to say, this is a burial cloth that wrapped the remains of a crucified man in full correspondence with what the gospel tells us of Jesus. Benedict said, he said the relic, one of the most important in Christianity should be seen as a photographic document of the darkest mystery of faith. That of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. Now, this is the same guy that retired, right? Yep. He said God told him to quit. But keep reading. Go ahead. The Shroud of Turin offers us the image of how his body lay in the tomb during that time of death, time that was brief chronologically, about a day and a half. Wait a minute. What? A day and a half? That kind of lines up with Good Friday and Easter, don't it? But what did Jesus say? Three days and three nights. Go ahead, a day and a half. But was immense, infinite in its value and significance, Benedict said. Okay, that's good on that. So here's another pope saying, hey, day and a half. But Jesus said three days and three nights. But they got to keep that Easter thing going. But that should raise a red flag to somebody. A day and a half. Not three days, not raised on the third day, but see, day and a half. But let's look at this, because they got to keep Easter going. But let's read this one little thing on Easter to let you know, because it's all about paganism, brothers and sisters. It's all about paganism. And this is an encyclopedia, too. It's the women's encyclopedia. Read what they say about Easter. Y'all don't have this. Women's Encyclopedia, page 267. Easter, springtime sacrificial festival named for the Saxon goddess Ostre or Ostara. So that's where the name Easter came from. It's a pagan goddess. That's why they're trying to change it now. They, they know it's paganism. So they're going to call it Resurrection Sunday now. They're going to get away from the Easter. We're going to call it Resurrection Sunday. Okay. It still don't fit. But they didn't rise on Sunday. Go ahead. A northern form of Estarte. Her sacred month was Estre, Monath, the moon of Oestre. Saxon poets, poets apparently knew Oestre as the same goddess as India's great mother Kali. Beowulf spoke of Ganges, waters whose flood waves ride down into an unknown sea near Oestre's far home. The Easter bunny was older than Christianity. It was the moon hair, sacred to the goddess in both Eastern and Western nations. Recalling the myth of Hathor Astarte, who laid the golden egg of the sun. Germans used to say the hair would lay eggs for good children on Easter Eve. So we can see, we can read Astarte, see, see in the Bible. And it's telling exactly what she is, a pagan goddess. That's where Easter came from. But they can't, you can't read that. They keep you out the Old Testament. But that's enough on that. Let's get back to the book. Jeremiah 10. So we see what we're dealing with. 
and we see who gave it to you. That's why we do the comparison. We read sound doctrine first, and then we read what they gave you, which is a lie. But they try to use sound doctrine to support it, but it don't work. The truth cannot uphold a lie. Jeremiah 10. And pick it up at verse 6. Jeremiah 10 and verse 6. Okay, read. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations, and in all their kingdoms there is none unlike unto thee. So one through five will tell you they're talking about a Christmas tree. But verse eight is going to tell you this about the people who are falling into this foolishness. Go ahead, verse eight. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. But the people that's doing these things, Easter bunnies and eggs and Christmas trees. They brutish, which means they have no knowledge. And foolish, too, because you're a fool if you don't understand the knowledge of God. Because the Bible says a fool said in his heart there is no God. That cat has no understanding. Brutish and foolish, and the stock is what? A doctrine of vanities. Nothing. It's lies. Go to um, Matthew 15. Matthew 15. We're going to read a couple verses here. Because these people are wholeheartedly steeped into this stuff. And they think they're doing Jesus some justice. But they have no understanding. That's why you pray for people to get some understanding. Because the Lord wants the world to be saved. He wants people to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's why you pray. I pray you get some understanding. Ask me to pray for I pray you get some understanding for somebody that I don't know. Because I don't know you. I pray you get some understanding that you come to the knowledge of the truth. 15 and 8, read. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And they do. People go wholeheartedly out for these particular days that they attribute to God. Christmas, Easter, I mean, it's a big time season. Big days, you know, families come together. Whatever. It's garbage now. But because you don't participate in it, you are garbage to them. And they hate you. Hating you without a cause, right? All about Christmas. The Christmas spirit is all about hate, especially if you ain't around. But go ahead. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So they worship the Lord for nothing. Teaching for what? Doctrines? The commandments of men. So these commandments of men are doctrine, but it ain't sound. It's a lie. Because all these traditions go against sound doctrine. And you can read it in the book. So if Jesus didn't die on Good Friday and he didn't rise Easter Sunday, when did he die? According to the book, sound doctrine, right? Mm -hmm. Daniel 9. Let's look at it. We can prove he didn't die by this on Good Friday by this one scripture. But because nobody listened to Jesus and said, search the scriptures, you believe he died Friday and rose Sunday. Just like my mom, she went to, you know, she go to the Sunday church, and she said her preacher, he was about to put Sunday to rest. So I guess he was going to say something against it. So she told me, you know, he just, he proved out the Bible that the seventh day, Saturday is the Sabbath. I said, okay, when y'all going to go to church again, ma? Uh, we'll be back there next Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you know. I've been telling you for the longest. Now you know because he said it. Now what you going to do? Because now he's held accountable. He's been chucking and diving all this time, and he knew, but now he want to teach what it is? Now you are held accountable, my friend. 
If you still want to continue this foolishness on Sunday, you go right ahead. You're going to pay for it. He even said, he was hyping it up. I'm going to shock some people. The people are going to get shocked today. Okay. They might have got shocked, but they didn't get shocked into life, real life. They still caught up in that darkness. Um, yeah, Daniel 9 and verse 26. Read it. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And that the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So now we talk about the Messiah. This whole ninth chapter of Daniel is a lesson within itself. But we're just going here to deal with when Jesus died. The Messiah. Verse 27, read it. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And he being the Messiah, not the Antichrist, which people try to teach. This is all talking about the Messiah. He's going to confirm the covenant with many for one week. Go ahead. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So the midst of the week, the middle of the week, he's going to cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Go ahead. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the, the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So based on sound doctrine, Jesus said he's going to be in the grave three days and three nights. Based on the lie, they tell you he died Friday and rose Sunday. You can't get three days and three nights on Friday to Sunday, but sound doctrine tells us he died in the midst of the week, which is Wednesday. So the last handout will let you know it's going to compare sound doctrine to the lie that they give you. Now what you gonna go with? And even this Pope know a day and a half. Don't compare to three days and three nights because you're missing a day and a half somewhere. Half of three is a day and a half. So the theory at the top, it tells you what it is, day and a half, that's wrong. Because you can't read that in the Bible. So we can read three days and three nights. If he died Wednesday, he was in the grave Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Thursday daytime, Friday daytime, Saturday daytime, three days, three nights, just like Jesus said. So we got to roll with that because the other Jesus is all about rabbits laying eggs. This Jesus is about sound doctrine that he got from the Father. And let's go to Deuteronomy 32. And I got three more places. And we'll be done. So now we didn't dealt with sound doctrine. We didn't dealt with where the lies came from. So we got to roll with the sound doctrine. And sound doctrine is from Genesis to Revelation. All this whole book. We're going to show you that. Deuteronomy 32. And pick it up at verse 1. I mean, yeah, 1. Okay, read. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as a small rain upon a tender herb and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. So the Lord's doctrine is going to drop as the rain. Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4. And that's sound doctrine. Boy, people just don't understand. They're playing with themselves. Proverbs 4. And verse 1, 4 and 1. Okay, read it. Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. So what's some good doctrine? What's some good advice for somebody? Keep the commandments. Keep the commandments and live. 
Ecclesiastes 12 will tell you, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. While you breathing, while you got breath in your nostrils, that is your duty. That's first and foremost. As long as you're doing that, everything else will fall into place. You're going to take care of your wife. You're going to teach your kids. You're going to respect everybody. You're going to love your neighbor as yourself because you got that fear of the Lord in you. But it has to start right there. Fear God. That's the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. Go ahead. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. That's right. Get some understanding with this wisdom. But it all comes with sound doctrine. Go to 1 Timothy. Let's go to the New Testament and see if this sound doctrine is still around. 1 Timothy 1. First Timothy one. And pick it up at verse one. OK, read Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. He's giving honor to the father and the son because they all want accord. Keep reading. Unto Timothy, mine own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So now we got something going around. Now somebody's teaching a different doctrine. But he's telling Timothy, look, charge them that they teach no other doctrine. What else? Go ahead. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. So what comes with that other doctrine? What's a fable? A lie. They take sound doctrine and change it to a lie. Go ahead. Which ministers questions rather than godly edifying, which is, which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity. Out of a pure heart and out of good conscience and out of faith unfeigned. And charity is none other than love. The conclusion of what of the commandment is just love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Go ahead. From which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Now here's a guy with two ounces of knowledge. He think he know it all. Two ounces. Go ahead. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers or for liars, for perjured persons. Now, this is what the law is made for these type of individuals. Whoremongers, sodomites, liars, people bearing false witness, murderers, fathers and mothers, idolatry. And what else? In case I forgot something. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So just in case, any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine, don't get caught up. Because you are breaking the law. So if somebody tell you, you only have to keep nine of the commandments. First thing you ask him is, where did you read that? Put the book on the table and say, show me in the Bible where it says I only have to keep nine. And then watch him squirm. Or watch him say, well, you don't understand. Titus 2, last verse. Titus 2 and verse 1. One verse, verse one. 
Okay, read it. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And I hope you got some understanding in Jesus' name. We welcome you and hope today's lessons increase your knowledge of the Holy Bible. CDs and DVDs of the Sabbath lessons are available. Please place your order and donation in the offering envelope and it will be filled on the next Sabbath. The children's class ages 5 through 12 starts at the same time as the adult Sabbath lesson in the assigned location. Bring your child so that their knowledge may be increased. Train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it. That's Proverbs 22 and 6. Adult teen question and answer is from 4.30 to 6.30 after the Sabbath lesson. We have question and answer every Wednesday at 5 p.m. via telephone conference line. The number and access code are located at the top of the lesson. Or see the live stream of question and answer at www.thykingdomcome7.com. If you are interested in being baptized, please place your name on the list at the literature table. Remember to follow the dress code when attending our services. Men should remove all hats and all head coverings during service times. Women should wear head coverings, such as a half hat or scarf during the service. Women should not wear tight-fitting pants or skirts or revealing clothing. Attire should be modest according to the Bible. If your child becomes restless during the Bible lesson, we encourage you to remove your child from the room until he or she is settled, or you and the child can watch the service from the family room. Your tithes and offerings are always appreciated. Please place your tithes and offerings in an offering envelope and deposit it in the offering box. Your cooperation is greatly appreciated. Again, thank you for coming, and we hope to see you on the next Sabbath. Peace.